From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Annika Walters. The Cronkite News Sports Bureau covers more than just scores and highlights. Tonight, we take you to Sun Devil Stadium for an inside look at the renovations and show you how athletes are making an impact in our community. A former Arizona Cardinal is using mixed martial arts techniques to try to make football a safer game. Cronkite News reporter Annika Walters tells us how this curriculum is keeping players safe. That's right, Patricio. You've heard the phrase, get your head in the game, but at this safe football camp, high school players are learning new ways to block and tackle by taking their heads out of the game. The safe football camp for high school offensive linemen in Phoenix may be one of the quietest versions of the sport. The whole idea is to try to slow the process down. It's not a typical football practice. No screeching whistle or loud crunches of pads and gear. It's more like a discussion. I wanna, I wanna intercept him with my backside. Former Arizona Cardinals center Scott Peters founded Safe Football in 2012 after he realized mixed martial arts techniques he was learning off the field could be used on the gridiron. Look, I just do this. It's part of my release every time. The guys are gonna generate more force. They're under greater control. And most importantly, with all the concussions that go on, um, trying to take away the head from contact. According to a 2011 study published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine, football is consistently the high school sport with the most concussions. But Deer Valley High School offensive lineman Joey Ramos and his father Jaime, Deer Valley's line coach, say no concussions have occurred on their line after learning to play safe football. Zero concussions that I've had. That's, that's a big thing for me. I've there's been one scratch on my helmet and I've had the same helmet for two years now. Now you can see the offensive linemen training behind me. They're not using mouth guards, they're not wearing helmets, and there's barely any pads on scene. Now Ramos tells me that the technique is much more important to preventing injuries than any kind of protection can provide. They're making a custom fit helmet, they're doing all this other stuff. They've got mouth guards that have sensors in them that can calculate you know, the impact level of a player. Um, so that's going to tell the coach, hey, your kid's got a concussion, but he's still got a concussion. Coach Ramos says the way to prevent injuries is with better technique, not better technology. In the broadcast center, Annika Walters, Cronkite News. Summer weather means football season is nearing, and one ASU football hero is trying to make it big. Mike Bercovici rose up the depth chart and led the Sun Devils to the most memorable comeback win over USC three years ago. Cronkite News Los Angeles reporter Devin Gooden tells us how this quarterback is trying to make a name for himself in the NFL. The last time fans saw Mike Bercovici in an ASU football uniform was the team's 2015 loss to Cal. Now, after a year away from football, Bercovici is making a second attempt to grab a roster spot with the Los Angeles Chargers. Study the playbook and the plays that I knew and some of the workouts that I, that I went to. It, g it gave me a lot of confidence coming back here. Even after his first cut from the Chargers, Berkovici had no doubt that he would see a professional training camp again. The day he got released to the day they called back, he never lost faith. He continued to work because he knew he'd get a call back at some, at some point. Didn't know when, but at some point he would. During his year away from the league, Berkovici started to prepare for life without football and improve his skills in a different field. He was doing, being mentored by some uh, commercial real estate um, folks out in Arizona, which he really enjoyed. Um, he was learning that side of the of the business because at one point you gotta you gotta go to the real world and and you're not playing games anymore. It was in January when Mike was offered a second chance to make the Chargers team. But this summer, he still faces the obstacle of making the final 53-man squad. It was a phone call I was waiting for. Uh, it was late in the last week of the season, and the immediate reaction was like, this is the opportunity I want. Last year, the Chargers retained only two quarterbacks, longtime starter Phillip Rivers and former Oregon standout Kellen Clemens. But... Berkovici enters this season confident he can make the team. Those guys have been here double-digit seasons in the NFL, and I'd really admire that. But, you know, in year two, I want to be at that same level, the same command, and, and I think that guys respect that. In Los Angeles, Devin Gooden, Cronkite News. In short order, the Sun Devil grab will be tested when quarterbacks report to training camp on July 29th. 
Tackle football is the most watched sport in the U.S. But Cronkite News LA reporter Carson Bushjo spoke with athletes from the largest independent women's football league. Right there, right there, right there. Tackle football is no longer the exclusive province of men. It's one of those things that your dad said you couldn't play because it was boy sport. Tell that to the 1,600 players and 36 teams in the independent women's football league. The 17-year-old organization was founded by a group of players dedicated to making football available to all women. We're playing women's tackle football. These women, they hit. Head coach of the Carson Bobcats, Bobby Hosea, founded the team last year. He believes women play to prove the doubters wrong. Probably the ones with brothers, you can't do that because you're a girl. You can't do that because, you know, it's for boys. And so I think they're anti that and they want to prove that they can do anything they want and to be honest they can. One of those players is five-time cancer survivor Jane Brinkman. In 2006 while living in San Diego she was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. Looking for an outlet she turned to the game she loved. I asked permission and I came out and tried out and then immediately literally three weeks after I started working out with San Diego State and playing football um, my white blood count went up. Brinkman continued playing while attending chemotherapy sessions. She's been competing ever since. It was uh, an outreach for me that I needed, and um, I'm here today because of it. The league has also given Brinkman's teammate, Drea Hollingsworth, an opportunity to play. She was born deaf, but the Bobcats have welcomed her as a part of the family. I feel like I'm part of the team, and it's really amazing feeling. This is my home, being part of the Bobcats. There is also a home for women's football players in Phoenix. The Phantoms play their games at Moon Valley High School, but no one is getting rich off the sport unlike the NFL. We want to be on the same level as the WNBA. You know, we want to be with the guys. You know, we want to be out there and recognize. After a two-month spring season, the Bobcats were able to advance to the playoffs with the championship game at the end of July. In Los Angeles, Carson Bush Jost, Cronkite News. The Bobcats currently have 18 players on the team, but owners hope to have more than 50 women playing within five years. Former ASU football player Mike Carney had a reputation as a bruising lead blocker in college football. After playing for the Sun Devils from 2000 to 2002, he entered the NFL and had a successful seven-year career. Now Carney takes on the selfless lessons he learned in the gridiron to his adopted community in Orange County, California. Cronkite News Los Angeles reporter LA Andrea Boyd reports. Despite being an all-pro fullback for the St. Louis Rams and New Orleans Saints, Mike Carney figured out at the beginning of his football career that he needed and wanted to make a difference when his playing days were over. There's such a high percentage of former players upon leaving the game that don't do well. And I never wanted to be one of those guys. And he wasn't. He took advantage of a four-day broadcasting crash course offered by the NFL and parlayed that into a job as an analyst for Fox Sports West's prep zone. I love high school football. And so looking at the grand scheme of things, knowing that I had no experience in broadcasting, heading into the broadcast boot camp and even coming out of it, that was the place to start. And that was just the beginning of Carney's post-NFL successes, which includes mentoring young athletes. I didn't have somebody to really kind of show me the way or to be like that person that could, I could go to and ask questions to. So I want to take that and be positive and impact young people's lives. Carney also carried his passion for mentoring to current players in the NFL. Today, he works as a running back coach and consultant for future NFL prospects at Exos, a preparatory program for the NFL Combine. And you're with guys that are like-minded. This is a dream for them too. So you're able to, I always tell them, I, I want you to experience the same thing I did and more, and how great, how cool it is to be able to, to, to kind of pay it forward and pass it on to them. And if he is not busy enough, he's an investor with his wife and residential properties. Being able to invest in real estate is something that I felt was going to be beneficial for me in building a bridge, walking across that bridge and into the next phase of my life. But like many 30-somethings that didn't play professional sports, Carney does have his challenges. The thing I'm most passionate about is purpose. 
looking to impact lives, looking to impact more people's lives. In Los Angeles, Andrea Boyd for Cronkite News. Carney is still tethered to the NFL as a uniform compliance inspector for the Los Angeles Rams. It's his job to make sure players' uniforms abide by NFL regulations on game day. We often see sports improving the life of students. A transgender student at New Roads High School in Santa Monica has started a new tradition in one of America's classic pastimes. Cronkite News reporter Chantel Delagula met up with him to hear his story. On the outside, Jake Hofheimer looks like a typical 18-year-old boy. What many people don't know is that Jake was once Emma. I was always sort of a tomboy. Jake lived as Emma for 13 years. Then a guest speaker came to his middle school for Diversity Day and opened his eyes to the possibility of being transgender. There was a trans woman speaking and it kind of all clicked for me then and I kind of just like realized, oh wow, this makes sense. Although Jake had a difficult time in middle school, he found solace in sports. When fall came around in 10th grade, I played on the fall ball team and I really started to just, you know, I fell in love with the sport. During the game, Jake's focus is on the field of play, but afterwards, he brings his big personality and loves to make his teammates laugh. He uh, brings a lot of life and uh, humor to the team, for sure. And he definitely, uh, I don't know, he helps us on the field and off become a team and kind of a family. Jake shares a special bond with his coach on and off the field. He's just one of the guys. I think the kids all will, will look back and realize that they were part of something very unique and very groundbreaking in a lot of ways. He's always, you know, pushing me. He never really treats me like I'm any different than any of the other guys on the team. Jake finally found a sense of belonging on a boys team and he hopes other kids can find camaraderie too. I think that, you know, I want to be able to share my story and inspire other people to be themselves and but also inspire other people to be accepting. Jake wants to continue his fight for equality as a politician by studying political science at the University of Colorado Boulder in the fall. In Santa Monica, Chantal Delagula, Cronkite News. Arizona has a case-by-case -case process when allowing transgender athletes to compete. There are only three situations where athletes born of one gender were allowed to play for the team of the opposite gender. ASU is the first Power 5 school to add a Division I triathlon team. And after just one year in existence, the team won a national title and made a huge statement. And as I found out, that's not all that's on the horizon. Most good things take time, but for the Arizona State women's triathlon team, it didn't take long at all. ASU was one of eight schools to receive a $140,000 grant from USA Triathlon, making it possible for the team to transition to varsity level in 2015. Just one year later, the Sun Devils won the national championship in their first season of competition. We could have waited a whole other year, built the team, then started our competition for fall 2017, but uh, I guess that's and <laughs> not the way I do things. I like to just throw myself into it. And the Sun Devils' quick dive into Division I didn't end there. In early April, it was announced that ASU was awarded its bid to host the 2017 National Championship in Tempe. That's, that's a great honor, and we are really proud to host, to host them here. We knew we had a, a, a good bid. I mean, 
it's, it's, a, it's a great location, consistent weather that time of the year. English said the course is already mapped out here at Tempe Beach Park, already hosting major events such as the Arizona Rock and Roll Marathon and Ironman Arizona every single year. And aside from the weather and the picturesque landscape, the triathletes here at ASU are just excited to have home turf advantage. It's close and I mean, I'm excited to have so many people here to cheer, who cheer for us. English says the event will also symbolize the growing interest of triathlon in the valley. It's definitely one of the hotbeds for triathlon and, and uh, you know, I definitely hope that we're contributing and growing. The Sun Devils will host teams from 16 schools across the country, consisting of roughly 65 competitors on November 5th. USA Triathlon previously hosted its collegiate club national championships in Tempe in 2013 and 2014, and ASU won the national championship last year down in New Orleans. And with more than 200 miles of trails in the valley, come rain, shine, or heat, some Phoenix residents and visitors are still enjoying their favorite hikes. Cronkite News reporter Annika Walters is at Echo Canyon Trailhead on Camelback Mountain to see about the dangers of hiking in this extreme weather. Here at Echo Canyon Trailhead, this thermometer next to me doesn't actually measure the temperature of the air, but it measures the temperature of the rocks and the terrain on the trail. Now, park rangers tell me even though this is already clocked out at 120 20 degrees, this trail can reach up to 180 this time of day, meaning hikers will stay much cooler in the morning. We've been born and raised our whole life in you know, Arizona, so something you kind of learn to get used to and you live with, but I mean, it's definitely something you want to come out here before it gets too hot during the day and not be out in the middle of it. The temperature does get to you, especially coming down in the sun. It starts to get real hot and you look for shade spots and pause in them. But no matter how hot it gets, park ranger Chris Webb said the trail is always open. The trail never gets closed due to the weather. The only time it ever gets closed during business hours is if there's a rescue and we need to close it down. When the temperature reaches this level, firefighters warn that it's best to stay inside. Captain Rita Bigler of Phoenix Fire Station Number 61, the fire station closest to the base of the Echo Canyon Trail, said heat stroke can happen faster than you think. You can skip right past heat exhaustion and get into a point where you're into heat stroke, which is actually, you, it can result in death. So that's one of those things. Now you put yourself on the mountain in terrain that makes it a little bit tricky for firefighters to get to. Time is not on your side. Captain Bigler also told me that the firefighters will go through special preparation in order to prepare for the mountain rescues. This includes wearing a full suit, hiking a trail such as this one, carrying weighted backpacks and extra water. But don't worry about me, I'm staying extra hydrated today. Live at Echo Canyon, Annika Walters, Cronkite News. So picture this, you can't make it to the ballpark for a game and watching it on TV just won't cut it. Yeah, well lucky for you, this new partnership between Major League Baseball and Intel has you covered. Major League Baseball has taken a step into the future. We set up our cameras and then bring VR, virtual reality, to the viewers. So without stepping out the door, baseball fans can feel like they're at the game and they can switch seats with the push of a button. We allow users to either select one of those four cameras and be their own, their own director. Or we provide a director line cut feed where our director chooses what they feel is the best image to allow that user to have a, a laid back experience. See, it's really simple for viewers at home from the comfort of their own couch who want to catch a ball game. All you need is a Samsung Gear headset and a Samsung Galaxy phone. Just snap the phone into the headset, throw the headset on, and just like that, you're at the ballpark. It's really providing that next step in technology that, that seems like everybody has a hunger for. The kind of the unknown, like, I, I want to experience something else, and, and virtual reality is that something else right now. But Rose says Intel isn't looking to replace TV broadcasts or physically attending games. It's too enhanced. Right now, we're looking at, at VR as a second screen experience. The setup process is different from a normal remote television broadcast because of the 3D experience. Those 12 sensors need to be stitched together uh, to create a 180 degree video that, that is seamless. And it creates some extra work for the team. It is out of the ordinary. So yeah, we do take some extra time and we want to make sure that they're, uh, they're getting exactly what they need. But for Geyer, it's all worthwhile because he hopes Major League Baseball is leading the charge 
into the future. It shows them that we're, we're willing to get on the cutting edge of what's, what's next. So get this, currently there's no charge to watch the games, but here's the catch. You can only watch live if you're out of market. So when Intel broadcasts a show at Chase Field, sorry d fans, you'll have to wait until the following day to watch. Some Arizona State students are giving up part of their summer to share the Sun Devil spirit outside the state. Cronkite News Los Angeles reporter Devin Gooden was in Anaheim, California to find out how Sun Devil Athletics and the ASU Caravan are giving back to the community. The Sun Devil Caravan had a two-day event in Southern California, bringing along several student athletes, band members, and some of the 942 crew, Arizona State's student section group. Sun Devil Athletics has made it a point to visit not just Arizona cities, but also Southern California to appeal to the larger ASU community in the region. Members of the caravan assisted with packaging at a local food bank and visited Walt Disney Elementary School in Anaheim. The Sun Devil Caravan is all about giving back to the community. Um, we want to come out here and help make a mark on the people here to show them what ASU truly believes in, and that's giving back to people. ASU is an amazing school, and so this is a huge population of the people that could possibly go to ASU. Kylie was a part of an ASU contingent of 30 that visited a food bank in Garden Grove, a community near Anaheim. The next day, while at Walt Disney Elementary School, the group led a presentation with the help of Sparky. The purpose was to show the kids what the Sparky acronym meant and to influence the students to pursue ASU. Principal T. Lai Fielder felt the ASU caravan proved beneficial for her students. I think it just gives them an opportunity to see what the future is like for them, hearing from other students that are further along in their experience. I would imagine that for the students and, you know, uh, coaches that came today, that that is inspiring to them and a very positive experience. The caravan has only been on the road for four short years, but Associate Athletic Director Bill Kennedy is hopeful that events like this will provide a positive impact for Sun Devil Athletics. One of the things that we do is bring student athletes, band members, 942 crew members, and the great thing is uh, these are very popular uh, trips and activities, so each year it has gotten easier to get student athletes to come along and, and be a part of it, and it's just continued to grow. The caravan finished its summer tour in Yuma on its way back to Tempe. For Cronkite News, I'm Devin Gooden. The ASU Caravan is the traditional kickoff to the summer season. You can keep up with the caravan at www.sundevilclub.com. Staying active and being outdoors can be a struggle in the summer heat. Some jump in the pool to cool off, others head to the yoga studio. But reporter Danielle Lincecum found a local valley business that's encouraging people to combine the two. The origins of paddleboard yoga are unknown but it brings together two ancient activities, yoga, which originated in India 5,000 years ago, and stand-up paddleboarding, which comes from ancient Polynesia. Desert Paddleboards in Mesa brings this new spin to classes across the valley. Face forward, yes, use your navel, Dive in towards the sky. A yoga teacher for about 20 years, Sarah Williams began to look for something beyond the typical class. A lot of people are just intimidated by yoga. People want something different and they want something that they don't feel like they're being judged. They're not staring in a mirror the whole time. It's just time to have fun. Williams had started Desert Paddleboards, a stand-up paddleboard rental business in Mesa. She found that potential customers who had never been out on a board were wary of taking them out on lakes and rivers. This drove her to start teaching stand-up paddleboard yoga two years ago at public pools around the valley. Participants love the melding of the two and doing yoga on the water. You really have to let go. You have to, your ego has to go away. You just have to try it. It really challenges your balance and you have to be willing to fall in so if you're gonna fall you gotta let go and fall in feels really good <laughs> because it's the water Sarah grew tired of hauling these traditional paddle boards back and forth between the pools so she flew to China where she designed these inflatable paddleboard mats that are perfect for doing yoga they're lightweight durable can withstand the Arizona heat and also fit perfectly between the lane lines. And I've been thinking about this mat forever and I kept emailing different distributors but I didn't feel comfortable about it and so finally I said I'm coming to Shanghai on this date. It was this little husband and wife couple. They take us into the factory they're so excited <laughs> and um, they show us the mats and I you know I changed a couple things about them and then the rest of the day they took us around China showed us all the culture. I was like an international businesswoman. 
<laughs> so fun. Williams held her first classes with these new inflatable boards in April. They are currently available to gyms who want to implement their own paddleboard yoga classes. I just say try it. It's so much fun. It's something different. And out here in the desert when it's really hot, it's the best thing you can do. Desert Paddle Boards holds paddleboard yoga classes in the mornings and night throughout the week at Mesa, Chandler, Gilbert, and Flagstaff public pools. People often separate the world of books from the world of sports, but at Comic-Con in Phoenix last weekend, we found one sport that bridges this gap. Among the madness at Phoenix Comic-Con, Arizona State Quidditch players taught young fans of Harry Potter to play a game that went from fantasy to real life. For eight-year-old Bailey Follett, playing Quidditch sent her practically soaring through the clouds. My favorite part is where you get to fly in the broomstick. It's like you're flying, and then you get to toss the ball. I pretend I'm flying. Quidditch is the sport the fictional Harry Potter played at Hogwarts, flying high on his Nimbus 2000. But without the magic of flight on a broomstick, young Comic-Con fans played a more grounded version, running around on a PVC pipe and scoring by throwing deflated balls at goalposts from both ends of the room. Of course, people of all shapes and sizes and ages love to enjoy Comic-Con, but McKenna Baum, captain of the ASU Quidditch team, tells me a specific reason why she's here. And we kind of just kind of spread it as a sport, you know, and let them know, because a lot of these kids have so much fun, and, like, I'm sure we're going to see them again. Like, we do see people, like, you know, coming back, and we've even gotten players, like, on our team from this sort of thing, so... It's really like, I think I like people's reactions the best out of everything, uh, because we say it, and they're like, you play what? ASU's had a club Quidditch team since 2009 and is a part of U.S. Quidditch, serving more than 4,000 athletes on almost 200 teams nationwide. According to usquidditch.org, there are 153 collegiate Quidditch teams, including Arizona State. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thank you for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.